Hey guys and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to try something a little bit different, a little bit new, and I'm going to start a series where we go back at some of the greatest races in the history of swimming, be it from the Olympics and World Championships, or just, just races that stand out as being very monumental for their time. And I'm just going to sort of review slash analyse a little bit of what's going on and just maybe bring attention to a race you've never seen. They were before your time, you never watched, and maybe you'll enjoy it. And I'll just do some sort of running commentary as we go. So today's video we're going to look at is the 2007 World Championships final of the men's 200 freestyle. It was in Melbourne. And I, I think for a number of reasons, this is a, a classic and legendary race that um, should be watched by any swimming fan out there and really, really has stood the test of time in terms of how fast it was. And as we can see, we have the field of swimmers here. And I think actually this, this 200 freestyle field is very stacked. So just going through from lanes one to eight, we have Paul Biederman. This is two years before he actually set the world record in this event in a 142.00 wearing the full Arena X Glide bodysuit. He's only 20 here, so he's young and he's just sort of making his, his name known on the world scene. In lane two, we have Park Taiwan. Not a huge fan of this swimmer because he has failed doping tests and is currently banned or basically ended his career being banned. So I'm not a fan of anyone who dopes. Um, but he was the 400 freestyle champion at this meet, and he did win the 400 freestyle at the Beijing Olympics the year after. We have one of the great 200 freestyles from Italy, Massa Milano, Rosalino. I'm probably butchering that name. And then in lane four, we have Peter van den Hoogenman. He won this event back in 2000, beating the great Ian Four. Lane five needs no real uh, introduction, Michael Phelps. And in lane six, we have... Kendrick Muck, I remember this guy. He, he was on the international scene doing some great things for quite a while. And then in lane seven, someone you've probably not heard of but should have, is Zhang Lin. Now, this guy would break the 800 freestyle world record in 2009 wearing a bodysuit in an absolutely mental time. I think it's 7.32. Basically, it's two 3.46s back to back. And he wasn't a huge name before that 800 freestyle or after, but he was a a feature in sort of 200 freestyle finals and a world stage, as you can see here. And to be honest, Nicola Casio, I, I, I've not really heard of myself. As we go through, the world record was Ian Forbes from 2001, and this hadn't been touched since. It was 144.06, which is a time that would win pretty much anything since. I think 144.0 would have won any international major meet, with the exception of 2007. 2008, 2009, and 2012, Yannick Agnell. I think every other year, including last year's World Championships, that would have won from back in 2001. That's absolutely mind-blowing. And it's funny because the depth in 200 freestyle has got a lot better. Now it takes 145, maybe 146 low to make a world final. Uh, and back then you would get 149s in, in, in the finals. With people like Phelps, Thorpe, and Hugenband, and even Grant Hackett, you had guys going 144, 145, 146, back, back since 2000. And really, you know, 145 low will win a lot of international meets to date. Uh, and 144, you're looking at definitely meddling almost guaranteed. So here we have Biedemann walking out uh, with the number one on his shirt. It's funny because back then he used to wear just Swedish goggles, no hat with fairly long hair. And, and leg skins, he didn't even, or jammers, I think he wears jammers here, so he didn't even wear a bodysuit back then. Uh, there's Van den Hoogenman and, and Phelps in the middle. So it took a 148.4 to qualify for this final, which wouldn't make him a semi-final today. So the depth was much, much worse back then, but we'll see what the winning time ends up being. And it's, again, this would have, this, the time that wins this would have won any meet going forwards. Uh, bar Yannick Agnell in London 2012. So there's Park. And it's funny because this was like a big year in terms of development of suits. Speedo just launched the FS Pro, which is very much like what we have today in terms of Speedo Laser Elite 2. It's a papery material without bonded seams, and it really paved the way for next year's Laser Racer launch, which basically took the FS Pro, added bonded suit seams, 
and polyurethane panels. But funnily, not everyone would wear the, the FS Pro bodysuit back then. A lot of people still wore leg skins. A lot of people still wore fast skin twos, and fast skin ones even, such as the women's Australian team. And it was funny because the year later, almost 100% of the, the, the competitors wore the Speedo Laser Racer. And the, the year after that, everyone wore either the Jacker JL1, the Arena X Glide, or the Speedo Laser Racer, and the likes of Michael Phelps. Who, as you can see here, was actually wearing a fast skin two bodysuit. So he's not even wearing Speedo's best suit. He was Speedo's flagship athlete, but decided not to wear the FS Pro, which is what Kendrick Monk is wearing here, the, the awesome looking green and yellow bodysuit from Speedo. And, and Speed done a great job of releasing sort of national colours of this suit for, for, for most teams. So you had the, the blue American one and the green Australian one and the red Canadian one. And here, here's a Nike suit from Zhang Lin. Again, I'm not sure if he wore a bodysuit or a leg skin back there, but as soon as he got the Arena X Glide on, he was setting world records. So as you can see, we've got a range of suits going on. We've got the FS2 bodysuit by Phelps there, you've got the Italians wearing arena power skins, Monk in the FS Pro, and you've got leg skins in Park Taiwan and Van den Hugenband and Zhang Lin's case, and just the jammers for Paul Biederman. So you see on the blocks back then, they didn't have the backboards like we do today, although they do have the side grips that they use in America. And some of them guys there are using grab starts. If we actually, actually rewind this and looking at Paul Biederman, and Paul Biederman and the Italian are using grab starts. That's just absolutely crazy. That's where you have both feet over the coping and your hands in between them. Uh, slower reaction, slightly more powerful, um, but no one does them today, obviously, with the, the, the block to the backboards on. And straight into the race, Phelps has opened up a monumental lead, but Van den Hoogenban is bringing it back back quite, quite nicely now, and he actually... Um, He's almost level now as we go towards the turn. If anything, I'd say slightly ahead. But no, 0-6 difference between them. Felt with a slight lead. But then, wow. Okay, let's just watch that again. Let's just watch how Phelps comes out of that turn. So they've gone in almost neck and neck. And then Hugenman surfaces just after five. And Phelps is up at 10 and takes almost half a body length off just on the underwater. And actually looking at the strokes there, they've all got quite smooth long strokes. But I'd say Phelps has the longest strokes. And I'm pretty sure he has the first three fifties are under 30 strokes of length. And he has 31 strokes of length on the last 50. Now let's watch here as we, we see another one of these world-class turns or best ever turns. Oh my God. That's, that's a game changer, that turn. And it's scary looking at the rest of the race. And you've got people like Zhang Lin and Park Taiwan and Paul Biederman not even a factor in these races. But look at this long, smooth stroke by Phelps. And it's funny actually, if you look in the underwater footage, he actually comes under his body. He actually pulls like this. Well, not maybe that's an exaggeration, but you, you, don't, you, you wouldn't recommend that. I wouldn't recommend that to any of my coach. But um, he's done it to a great effect. And I'll, I'll, we've, got to, we've got to watch that this turn again. So he, he has taken a, a charge and lead now, but let's just see how he comes out this turn. Still under. Oh my God. To do that at the end of a 200 freestyle when everything must be hurting, your legs must be aching, absolutely gagging for air, and to go past 10 meters and open up this lead over the Olympic champion from Sydney. Unreal. And this was, this was as I said, Phelps' first time that he really took the 200 freestyle as his event and become the guy. It's lovely gallop hybrid freestyle. He's tying up a little bit and touches just under the world record. The first ever sub 144. Hugenman second and Park then comes back hard for a third place finish. Uh, the, the bodysuit wonders Biederman and Zhang Lin not on the podium. And um, yeah, this was the first time Phelps sort of said, I am, I'm not just a butterfly swimmer and a medley guy, I'm a versatile swimmer. I'm now the world record holder in the 200 freestyle. And I think at this point he had the world record in the 200 free, 200 fly, 200 IM, 400 IM. Throw the relays in, but he was also that summer nearly broke the 100 and 200 backstroke world record. He went a 53 0 um, in the 100. Uh, I forgot what he went in the 200, maybe a 153. So uh, these turns, we could, I could watch these all day. Like This is why your coach tells you to do underwaters. 
this is why they absolutely em emphasise how important underwaters are. Um, he breathed in the last five. I don't let my swimmers do that. So maybe he could have been a little bit quicker. And he was the following year. He was a 142. So maybe he didn't breathe last five there. Hugenau was on the lane rope there. Yeah, so it's, it's funny, he lifts the head up as, as, it, as, he, as he sets his catch, his head lifts up into the breath. It sort of creates that, that gallopy stroke that he has there. And yeah, number one. If you ever wore a body suit, you knew the first thing you wanted to do was rip it off after you finish a race. And yeah, this is what I was saying though. So you've got Phelps up the top, 143, but no one else was under 146. So this would win most races, 143, but 146, that... Hugenband's time may have made finals in the in the last few years. So that's just how far ahead Phelps was in the rest of the field. First sort of video like this. I hope you enjoyed it. Different sort of type of video. And if you did and want to see more, let me know what races you would like, like to see me analyse. Any legendary races that stick out in your mind. As always, please leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you on the next one.